<laughs> yeah, I see virtually. So we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Culturism, our weekly show that I host here on LinkedIn and now as well on Clubhouse. Uh, we have with us today uh, a very special guest all the way from USA, uh, Sarah, and I'm going to welcome her on stage in LinkedIn right now. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, Apa Kabar. <laughs> hey, Kabar it's been a long time since uh, Brabasa, so let's let's do a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah, wonderful to have you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you uh, who Sarah Chen is if you have not met her yet. She is uh, on the Forbes Under 30 Venture Capitalist. She is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Billion Dollar Fund for Women uh, Beyond the Billion, as well as a board member and a speaker and is passionate about closing the gender gap in venture capital. Wow, all of that, Sarah. But, you know, that's not, uh, that's not good enough for our audience. Actually, what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, on LinkedIn as well as on Clubhouse, we're going to ask Sarah rapid fire uh, manner 10 questions that will reveal to us who the real sarah is i hope you're ready for this sarah um we have our first question are you ready first question is yes. could you describe yourself in just three words oh this is a good one and, and as if has not prepped me so you know this is off the cuff but i think first and foremost of course is ambitious ambitious uh, driven and persistent. I, I feel like they're all related, but <laughs> yeah, I think those are the three. If you ask anyone, you know, that would be the three because that's how they describe you as well. <laughs> Ambitious, driven, and persistent, Sarah. That's right. But uh, I just came off of a room that was chaired by Az, uh, Azra and Osman Rani, and they were talking about fears. So your next question is what is your biggest fear, Sarah Chen? Hmm, my biggest fear is. Um, actually one that is not just personal but of a lot of us you know i i see this uh, as well in, in some of my friends and it's really you know the reason for why i do what i do which is the fear of not living up to our full potential and, and i'm so passionate about us rising to our potential and, ex and expanding that um and it would be you know a greatest regret if i'm on my deathbed and i realize hey i wasted this one life that i had and the opportunities that i had Excellent. Uh, now that you've told us that, tell us about your weirdest quirk. What's a weird quirk of Sarah? My weirdest quirk? Um, if you ask my <laughs> husband, he will tell you a lot of weird quirks that <laughs> I have. I'm sure he would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am a very weird person. I, I, I sincerely believe that. Uh, weird quirk. Let me think of one. Um, I am despite how hard I try and how much I believe in it, uh, in being a morning person, it is genuinely hard for me. And what I do to wake up early is I actually lie in the bed, no joke, and listen to morning affirmations. <laughs> like, I can do this, you know, get out there and things like that. So that is weird. And I'm lying in my bed, but you know, that gets me into the rhythm, even though I uh, don't want to and definitely uh, need to have my cup of caffeine in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, if you were to get to meet, and, and you are located in uh, Washington, D.C., Sarah? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So when you meet, when, when you meet uh, President Biden, what would mm. you say to him? What would you say to him? What would I say to him? Wow. Um, I think first and foremost is, um, you know, as a, Malaysian immigrant, I, I think, um, you know, coming to the US, I, you know, we're talking about culture here today, I've appreciated um, some of the institutions that we've seen despite, you know, uh, challenging four years. Um, you know, it's been interesting to for me to see the institutions that have worked, um, you know, and I think what I would say is um, uphold those institutions that make make america and uh, because that's you know the pillars of, of freedom and so much of what uh, we all you know aspire to and, and believe in and uh, yeah I, I think it's it's important it's it's easy to forget uh some of the privileges that we have in this society um but yeah i think as a leader of of 
you know, the, the free world, right? It's important to continue to uphold uh, the integrity of those institutions. So that will be right. my number one. Cool. Uh, yeah, hope you see Tim soon <laughs> so you can carry this <laughs> to him. Uh, very quick shout out to our uh, viewers and listeners at LinkedIn. We have Novita Sari from Indonesia. We have Yao NJ. We have Aizat, uh, Nizar, Amir Hamza, Hasma, uh, Carl, Sean Watkins, all the way from the States. We have Roslan Jaynes. So, you know, we have a lot of people as well on uh, Clubhouse. So, Thanks for tuning in, guys. Uh, we are talking with Sarah Chen right now. And in this segment, we're asking her a rapid fire 10 questions to get to know her better, right? And uh, the next question, since you mentioned you're a, a Malaysian immigrant to the United States, the next question is, nasi lemak or roti canai? Oh, that's a very hard choice. But I have to say nasi lemak for now. Nasi ah. lemak because it is very hard to find and the art you know, what you all may not appreciate, which I so appreciate now, is the art of making the ikan bilis crispy <laughs> and with the sambal, it's hard to pull off. So, <laughs> nasi lama all the way. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Nasi lama it is. Uh, now, we are going to talk about stereotypes and, and diversity. And so, this question is, if you were a man, what mm. would you be called and what work would you do? Wow. Uh, never been asked that one before. You know, I, I don't think I personally have aspirations to be other than myself. Uh, frankly, I think I've, I've come of age or, or some sort, right, um, in which I'm happy in my skin. I think there's a lot more to be done. Uh, but I, I really think this is the time of the, you know, the, the women to shine. And, and I'm excited to be part of this journey. And, and I'm seeing change. There's a lot more to be done. But like I said, you know, um, because I care so much about this, I can't imagine being anyone other than myself. I might be, um, you know, a, a man working on this issue later, <laughs> if, if that was, um, you know, uh, a, a possibility. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have an answer for the question because I've never <laughs> thought about it. I think there's nothing that women uh, cannot do. And therefore, you know, if anything, I would maybe aspire to, uh, you know, step in the shoes of some of the great women of our time and, and see their lives and aspire to that. So, yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, a, lo a lot of men, a lot of men are on board and are working for the same causes that you are. I think when we met, I was on the board of Girls in Tech Malaysia. Uh, and so, you know, I still am very passionate about diversity and equality. So, you know, even if you were a man, I don't know what your name would be. I think you'd still be championing these issues. <laughs> I think so too, because, you know, I think that's an important point, Isaac. And, and of course, you know, I want to shout out to your support. Uh, I think you supported us, you know, even uh, when you were, you joined Cellcom and things like that. So uh, just being an ally to this, because this issue of women's empowerment, sure, we put women in the, the first part of, of the equation, but it's, it's one that's important for us all because, it's 50% of the population that you're not tapping into. It is in our companies, you know, it's it's uh, our future together. So when we don't unleash the potential of, if you, you think about it from a, you know, to your point of culture within a company, if you're not unleashing the full potential of your workforce as a leader, uh, you know, that's, that's not what you want, right? So it's one that is uh, beneficial for us all and it should be a um, shared issue is what I believe. For sure. Uh, if, what was your favorite cartoon growing up? Oh, <laughs> favorite cartoon. Wow. You're, you're, you're giving me all the tough questions. You know, I've been prepared, uh, like I'm going on Bloomberg next week. So I'm like prepared for the economic questions, future trends, but the cartoon question, that's a yes. tough one. Um, I don't actually know if you know this, but Little Lulu was one of my favorites. So this might reveal my age, but you know, she was a smart uh, little girl in a red uh, dress. Uh, I hope some of you are on, online here know Little Lulu, but it was on Cartoon Network back in the day when we um, watched Apani. Uh, Mega, you know, back in the day of Mega TV, do you all remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before Astro. So yeah, that might reveal my age, but Little Lulu, I, I, I sincerely, 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't think I've watched that particular show, but yeah, I remember Mega TV and Cartoon Network. So, um, on a scale of one to 10, how cool are you? Oh, 10. <laughs> wow. Yes. I, yes. I'm, I'm weird and cool. cool at the same time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Both my favorite characteristics, weirdos and cool people. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, final question. And I asked the same question to all my guests. Uh, who is the kindest person that you have met personally? And tell us a story about him or her. Kindest person that I have met. Um, you know, I, I have to say I meet a lot of kind people in my life. And, uh, you know, if you, um, I, I don't know if this is the saying, um, but, you know, sometimes you, you uh, go into different situations and you feel like there are guardian angels watching over you. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I've certainly had those situations because, you know, I mean, I just look at my journey in the last couple of years moving to america was is still hard you know there's a big culture shock you know it's very different from malaysia the things that i've had to learn um from ground zero and, and you know I, I didn't actually have networks here so i had to build that up and hustle in the last couple of years but i've i've benefited from the kindness of so many people who saw what i was trying to do and were just genuine in saying hey let me help you and that's really the genesis of, of everything. And, and I guess, you know, one that comes to mind with that recent experience is, of course, my co-founder of the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, Shelly Porges, uh, who used to work for Secretary Clinton as a senior advisor. And she was also chief marketing officer of Bank America, has a storied career. And, you know, um, she she's pretty, I would say, you know, plugged into the networks, being a true entrepreneur investor. And when I reached out to her, and said, you know, with so the idea of the billion dollar fund for women, you know, I give her full credit for that. She said, hey, this is what I'm working on. And when she brought up the two key words of venture capital and women leadership, which, as you know, as if you, you've known me for a while, it's the two things I really, really am passionate about um, that, you know, sort of rang the bells for me. And I said, well, can I help you? You know, I have some time on my hands. Um, you know, I, I, and I care about this and, and I, you know, see what I can do. And she was kind enough to say, Sure, let's, you know, let's see what happens. And, uh, you know, I showed up and brought my game, brought my A game and became a co-founder because she realized, hey, this girl is not just a contributor, but a leader. And, and we need to work together on this. And we've been working together ever since. And what's interesting, and this might be a topic to, to chat about as well, is the multi-generational approach in leadership. So, you know, she's um, in a totally different generation um brings with her the experience that i don't have and similarly i feel you know there are certain things that um i enrich her with and our experience together and it's been very beneficial especially for this agenda where the two key groups that will be inheriting and you know are growing wealth and power um throughout the world and starting with the us is uh, millennials which i represent and the next generation that are more conscious about what their investments will uh, result in and, and what sort of impact they're creating. And of course, you know, the uh, wives, the baby boomers that are um, growing in, in influence and, and wealth, and she represents that. And so when we, you know, enter rooms, especially working with financial institutions and and all that, it, it's, it's interesting just to see the dynamic. And I uh, have to say, you know, I work well in uh, a duo, so I, I'm always a dynamic duo, even in the last, uh, with Lean in Malaysia, which with Abir Abdul Rahim, uh, I, I, you know, I, I love the energy feeding off each other sort of thing. And with her, you know, it's I've really been able to be my full self and talking about culture, even working with someone who's so much more experienced than I am, I've never felt less than her. She's never made me feel less than her. But in fact, you know, when I am less, she backs me up and I do the same for her. And, and I think that's truly a relationship that has benefited me and in, in our agenda and um, has stemmed from her just being kind to me. And, and that's wow. how we started and how we're a billion dollars strong and growing. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a great dynamic. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up. So now that our 10 questions, the really tough questions that you've answered, it's it's smooth sailing from now on. <laughs> so uh, <It's> over. <laughs> could you for maybe uh, our, our audience who don't know who you are, 
maybe you'd like to introduce yourself in terms of what you're doing now uh, in the States and, uh, you know, what, what's keeping you busy. Sure, my pleasure, Azif. So my name is Sarah Chen. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm currently the co-founder and managing partner of the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, also called Beyond the Billion. And we're on a mission to close the gender venture funding gap. So some of you may know that of all venture capital, you know, starting with the U.S., which is presumably one of the more advanced markets for venture capital, only 2.2% of all venture capital goes to female founders. And it's regressed this year. I think it's uh, in the last year, it was 2.1%. And when you include um, gender diverse teams, so where there's at least one female founder in the team, which is also what I truly believe in, 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 you know, really having diversity at the table, it's, you know, 12, 13%. So what we're saying here is the majority of all venture capital funding goes to uh, all male teams. And, you know, we're, we're on a mission to change that. There are many issues that I can unpack here, but, you know, what we've done is to take a systemic approach. And, uh, you know, I used to work in corporate venture capital in Malaysia and uh, also started lean in Malaysia. So that's a little bit of sort of, you know, two uh, hints into what I care about already. And when I met Shelly, as I mentioned, you know, we create a, a systemic approach to addressing this issue. We're a global consortium of over 90 funds now, close to 100 uh, that have, taken the pledge and are actively deploying beyond a billion dollars to its female founders across the globe. So my daily work involves working with VCs and uh, limited partner investors that invest into those funds to think about how can we be doing better? You know, do we need a hire? Do we need to uh, build our pipeline? So what does this look like and how can we do this more meaningfully? So that's a little bit of a snippet of what I do and uh, happy to unpack uh, all of that. Wow. Uh, when did you start this up? So a uh, couple of months after I moved, <laughs> I moved to the US. So, you know, I was looking for what next. And it was uh, two months before we had the opportunity to launch at the World Bank meetings in Bali in 2018. So October 2018 was when we launched and we started, you know, I personally started work on it. I want to say like two months before that when I joined. <laughs> wow so it's been a whirlwind then so but it has Indeed. been uh I, I would imagine an uh, an event for three years now that you've uh, it's already 2021 so yes what kind of um progress um, have you seen in in the world of vcs around the world now that you're into this space now so I have to say with our initiative, we've seen uh, a lot of progress. Uh, I have to say not enough. I mean, the fact that, you know, when, before we started, right, a lot of these funds that we're working with are not gender lens funds. And what that means is that uh, there are some venture capital funds that invest with uh, specific mandate and intention to find uh, sort of female founders, right? So you think about female founders fund, for example. Whereas many of our funds are those that are investing in SaaS, B2B, you think about um, Gobi partners closer to home, Golden Gate Ventures, there's some of our partners that have made that pledge. And, you know, before our initiative, this was not something they did explicitly. And we're proud to have brought them on board to think more uh, conscientiously about this agenda, even uh, SG Innovate, which is Singaporean's government's uh, deep tech fund. I uh, was, you know, lucky to have bumped it to San Hui, who leads the Ventures team and, and was very, um, you know, switched on to why this is important and what we must do. So um, I think the progress of even just being more aware and realizing, you know, on the heels of the Me Too movement, right, that this is, uh, it, it's not only about, uh, and, and we can talk about that, right? So that's very important in terms of, of um, culture as well, but um, beyond just, changing the landscape within our companies it's about the dollars and that's what we're all about which is you know putting dollars in your beliefs right your value system and changing the landscape because you know if, if this is the world that we have with you know only a small proportion of capital going to female founders think about the potential right back to my biggest fear which is not rising to our full, full potential what what is you know the loss here the loss of huge opportunities that we have i mean um you know you look at the covid vaccine right now right um I, i'm so proud to have read the stories of how it was a husband and wife team that worked on it mrna technology a lot of that have come from the from the minds of female innovators women innovators right. and, and we must continue to you know seek that out and, and empower 
them and, and help them shine. And I think, you know, um, it is uh, incumbent upon us. It is uh, it's about damn time, <laughs> as our friend Arlen ha Hamilton say. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of change, but not enough. Um, you know, we've regressed actually in the last year. I think if you uh, reflect on the, uh, I believe it's World Economic Forum, um, sort of stipulated that last you know in the last year because of women leaving the workforce in droves uh, mm. because of the fact of that uh, you know we came up beyond the building came up with a, re with a report or with pitch book as well on the fact that in the last three quarters uh, first three quarters pardon me of 2020 uh, funding to female founders had declined drastically by 31 percent and the reason for that is you know a lot of um, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons to that, but part of it is because female founders are, you know, still in the early stages and they're not getting the majority of the capital in the later stages, right? And what we want to do now is because we're seeing the pipeline, we're seeing these great women, we need to push them along the pipeline and ensure that um, they're continuing to start businesses. Women are starting businesses at a higher rate than ever before. I think, you know, all around from an agenda point of view, I think this moment is you know, that's why I, I say I love being a woman right now, because I think the moment generally is now. I think it's um, it's what we do with our platforms and how we move forward and not regress. Uh, we are worried. I am worried that uh, some of the trends with COVID has been uh, disproportionately impacting women. Um, but, we, you know, I, I think we're all committed as, uh, you know, as the VCs, as investors, as the entrepreneurs. We're, we're all thinking hard about this and, and taking action as well. And, um, you know, what we're doing beyond the billion as well, which is the evolution of the name, the billion dollar fund for women, because once we hit the billion, we realize part of the issue is not just the VCs, right? So some people forget and think that, you know, once you're a VC, you're rich. The fact of the matter is you're a money manager and you get investments from, as I mentioned earlier in the call, limited partner investors. So these are family offices, hang out with individuals, uh, some entrepreneurs, you know, they use their own capital, if they've cashed out. Uh, but there are also the pension funds, endowments, things like that. And that's a huge chunk of capital that is not yet being tapped into venture capital. And what we're trying to do here is to advocate and to uh, bring, catalyze more capital from, you know, the larger institutions as well. And I think that's with the racial reckoning, you know, the George Floyd incident last year, there's been a lot of uh, realization that this is important. And, uh, you know, we're, we're tracking the numbers. So we're seeing... Uh, folks like Bank of America uh, that never would have, you know, um, maybe done it in such a large way, but that the CEO Brian made a big statement and, and are deploying uh, capital to funds that are smaller than their usual check size because, you know, they, they said, well, it's time to figure it out, right? So to the point of legacy cultures and things like that, I, I'm a huge believer of um, there needs to be some disruption when, when it, you know, when it calls for and uh, you know, a change of results. And uh, that's what we're seeing. So, you know, it's a, it's a long answer to a complex question but in that we're seeing, you know, great movement ahead, but also some regression with COVID. But uh, bottom line is a lot more work to be done and right. um, all across the world. Well, uh, COVID notwithstanding, the, the statistics that you quoted were quite shocking actually the i mean the, the amount of funds that go to all women founders and even when you say if going to diverse founders uh, men and women is such a small percentage uh, i know like you said there's there's various reasons but what would be the key drivers to that is it just because tech is a you know an old, old boys club or you know what are the main reasons you find that vcs just don't fund women founders? So I, I think it's multiple. Again, you know, your questions don't come with a single answer, but I, I start with, you know, the fact that biases are real, um, even till this day and age. And, you know, it, it happens to both men and women, right? So we're, we're all biased in evaluating. And I give you an example of uh, one of the academics that looked at this area, uh, Dana Kanze, I believe is her name, where she looked at how questions were framed in a pitch uh, to female founders and male founders. And female founders tend to be asked preventative questions. So things like, what is the market risk here? You know, mm. uh, what is the, you know, how are you thinking about mitigation of these risks versus for male founders, 
uh, they tend to be asked promotion questions, right? And it's the same thing also within a corporate construct. So, versus, you know, instead of saying, oh, what are you going to do because, you know, you, you might be pregnant in the last, you know, in, in the next couple of months um, for, for the men, they're thinking, oh, yeah, you're going to be more stable, right? So it's, mm-hmm. it's sort of the opposite uh, effect. And, and uh, I, I regret that. I, I think I still see that. You know, I hear it from my friends where uh, a man who is married, he seemed to be more stable, a woman who is married, uh, and they both, you know, share the same household, it's the same marriage, uh, that the burden of viewing domestic responsibilities as a risk uh, that she'll be less committed is, is still falling upon the the woman. So, you know, that's the start of, of where, you know, how we unpack this issue. But beyond that, the fact that VCs in itself, you know, the decision makers in the U.S., only one point, you know, we're talking about U.S. financial assets. So I'm talking about the limited partners to begin with, right? Only 1.3% of all U.S. financial assets are controlled by women and people of color, right? So start there. And then you go to the VC level. It's only... 12% in the larger funds that are women on the other side of the table writing those checks. Right. And, and this is not to say that men don't fund women, but the likelihood of us having those networks, right? Um, like you think about your network and mine, you know, we might be equal here, but I can guarantee you, I can probably name um, 50 women in the women empowerment field or that are doing amazing things, whereas you might have um, maybe 30. Or 40 right and I, I think there's a conscious effort that we all have to play um but yeah I, I think it starts with all that who are the decision makers there are also real structural issues right you know that the, you know when i talk about the 1.3 percent of financial assets going to being controlled by women and people of color um that is also reflected in sort of you know who gets funded at the fund level and there are real structural biases there as well and structural issues so you know i, I insinuated this a little bit in which um even at the vc level as a fund you know the, the business of managing a venture capital fund people forget how hard it is uh to fundraise and all that but there are many issues for you to even you know if you are a small fund right so if i'm a vc with a 10 million fund I'm not even going to qualify for the, you know, financial institutions who wouldn't bother to write that check. But if I'm a woman or a person of color um, that may not have the track record, right, I can't even qualify for some of those things. So, um, yeah, I think there's many nuances here. It's complex um, and, you know, there's there's a lot to unpack, but it starts with us being conscious about it, being aware and addressing it intentionally. And what we're doing with Beyond the Billion and, and the Billion Dollar Fund for Women is saying, hey, um, there are funds out there that are ready to deploy and are deploying because they're seeing women innovating across the board. And I think that's a very strong message. And, you know, to speak about some of our successes, you know, some of our funds who launched the agenda strategy with us have continued to see outperformance uh, by their founders that are gender diverse or led by female founders. You know, we're talking about higher retention rates and, you know, you know, running a company that's so important from an HR perspective. Beyond that, profitability is up. And, you know, even in a time of COVID, I, I quote uh, Kuki Mok, who's from Go- Gobi Partners, where, you know, on the heels of COVID, just, you know, lockdown happening. And we asked him, hey, what do you think is going to happen? Are you worried at all with your founders? And he said, you know, Sarah, I sincerely think that the women are going to be okay. I'm a little bit concerned about the men because um, <laughs> these women have their cash management done, you know, because the, you know, the, the sad, unfortunate fact is that women get less funding. But then uh, that means they're more uh, sort of rational with, with what they have, right? Because they've been so used to having to be resilient through it all. Um, so we're seeing them actually do really well through COVID, you know, those that have the funding and are able to sustain throughout this time. Wow. Uh, I have another powerful woman waiting in the wings. Uh, we have Ayu Shahira. She's a very young woman uh, who's just started work actually in a, in a global a multinational petroleum oil and gas company uh, but she's become sort of a LinkedIn celebrity here in Malaysia because she's been helping so many people especially young people you know get jobs and uh, advising them on that and her content gets tremendous amazing uh, gets amazing uh, uh, engagement sorry I was I was muted on Clubhouse so I just had to unmute my mic so anyway are you welcome on board and I know you have some questions for Sarah so this the mic is yours
Uh, we can't quite hear you. Uh, are you? Mm -mm. Can you hear me now? No. And as if I see a question from Wenjie as well. Uh, yes. Should I take that later or after are you? Thanks, yeah. Wenjie, for that question. I have my eyes on that. Yeah. As soon as are you can work your mic here. Uh, I don't think you're muted, uh, but okay, I'm unmuting you now. Nope, we still can't hear you. No, something is wrong with your mic. So yeah, why don't we go to uh, the question by Wen Jay, and I'll put it on the screen right now. And Ayu, maybe you can uh, work on that mic for a second. Okay, so he's talking about, yeah, discrimination. And if you have had uh, experience uh, personally with these and... Uh, so this is in the context of the U.S., right? Yes. Uh, so Wenjie, thanks, thanks for the question. You know, this is a challenging time for Asian Americans who are under attack, unfortunately. Um, and as well with the reckoning of uh, the, the killing of George Floyd, I think it's, it's a moment in time, uh, which is very important. And I think we're seeing a lot of um, real change and a lot of... Uh, real action being taken to addressing those things. But, you know, for me personally, just to speak of my personal experience, I've not encountered that in uh, in the US. Um, thankfully, you know, I, I I think being also a little bit in a, I have to say a little bit in a bubble in that, um, you know, we are working on an issue which promotes uh, diversity. So uh, tend to attract the right people. Of course, we've had rejection uh, you know, I've been told no many times, in fact, um, you know, from powerful folk who we expected to have said otherwise. Uh, but I take that in stride and I don't take that personally in that they're discriminating against me, but they perhaps may not be enlightened as yet to the agenda. So uh, that's my short answer then. And, and, you know, to be traumatized, I think it's, um, you know, it's sad. I, I think the, the trauma here is real. I, I'm personally also still learning from you know, what it means to be black in America. And, and that's a very um, different experience to what we have in Malaysia. I'm, I'm assuming you, you're from, uh, that, that might be a, a bad assumption on my part. I should have mm -hmm. looked at your profile, but, you know, assuming we're, we're all coming from the Asian region here, the experience of, you know, being black in America is something I, I will never understand. Uh, but I, I'm learning, I'm learning from my friends about how hard it is, even, you know, what are my friends who is a mother to her beautiful children had shared with me even in the early days how she had to prep um, her son before going out, you know, in case a police officer stops you and things like that. So uh, those are things that, you know, I, I can't imagine having to tell my, you know, future child. And in Malaysia, I'm glad that I never grew up feeling in that way and that sure, you know, we have to be uh, careful and cautious and Actually, for women in Malaysia, it might be a little bit tougher because I still remember the fear of going to the car park and holding the key because you know late at night working in the office because uh, the disparity in wealth in Malaysia is is high, right? And mm -hmm. uh, we're starting to see all these things. But um, yeah, I'm I'm hopeful that this moment in time um, will awaken some people to an issue that has been uh, long ingrained. But um, yeah, I think we're seeing positive steps forward and hopeful for a uh, better future. Thanks so much, Wenjay, for that wonderful question. And now we're back with Ayu Shahira. Are you uh, there, Ayu? It may be an issue with her connection since she's not, uh, she seems to be frozen right now. Yeah, I don't think she's able to connect right now. So anyway, we'll continue our conversation, Sarah. Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard and I've read was that VCs say that it's not them trying to consciously uh, discriminate against women founders, but it's the funnel. There's women are not coming forward to found companies and, you know, they, we, we don't see them. They say, we, we, where are they? <laughs> They're not coming for, for funding. So what do you say to that? Yeah, so, you know, I... <laughs> That comment always rolls, rolls me up a little bit because, <laughs> you know, I, I give an example, right? So one of our funds, when, you know, when we get them to take the pledge, we also try our best to help where we can. And uh, one of them said to us, hey, you know, because of a very specific niche of growth stage uh, SaaS in the automotive area, 
uh, with automotive applications, we just can't find the women. And this is particularly somewhere in Europe. And within, I want to say three weeks, and this is not our, you know, bread and butter. Uh, within three weeks, we just activated our networks and made a couple of calls and resurfaced three fantastic deals led by women. So that is to say, I mean, that's just, of course, you know, it might be an outlier uh, example, but that is to say that it, it's, I don't believe it is a pipeline problem, a hundred percent, you know, on a 360 basis, I think in some pockets, especially emerging markets and nascent ecosystems, including that of Malaysia, we need to work on it. Um, and it starts with education. It starts with, you know, exposure and exposing uh, both men and women into building beyond copycat business models, right? Start there. But right. I think that, um, you know, for those that are, you know, saying, using that as a blanket, I, you know, there are no women. I, you know, I would challenge that in saying, what do your networks look like? How are you sourcing them? And another example, another anecdote I'll give is, you know, one of the uh, senior, you know, I talk about rejection, right? So obviously my job, I get rejected a lot. It's become part, part of the job. <laughs> and he said to me, and this is a very senior person, I, you know, I wouldn't name names here, but he said, Sarah, you know, I, I treat uh, everyone that comes to my door absolutely equally. When I see a female founder or a male founder, I treat them equally. And then I, I questioned, okay, so how many female founders do you have? And of course, the answer is zero. And, and we checked the website before the call, of course. And that is to say, you know, you need a challenge. The, the question is not so much what you do when they get to the door. It is what does it take to get to your door and through your door in the first place, right? And it's about our networks. It's about, um, you know, what is your message out there? The, the fact, you know, one of the successes that we, you know, like to to share is with some of our funds who never actively said that this is what they were doing. Uh, when they did that, so, you know, some, someone like Gobi Partners were one of the funds that actively said we're going to do 50 million and they're, they're you know, fully deployed now uh, from their pledge. But the moment they said that, a lot of the female founders, you know, perked them and said, oh, this is a, this is a fund that has the welcome mat open. And, and if you go to our website, you know, all those funds, from Motley Fool Ventures in the US to Rethink Impact 182 million fund uh, to digital partners in Germany, all of them essentially are saying, we have the welcome mat open for you and um, you know, come and apply and, and you know, join, the, join the group. And if, it's, if you're not ready yet, we're still willing to have the conversation. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of how do we uh, take the fact that we're not seeing enough of the numbers and questioning what is it that is causing that and not just blaming the women. You know, I, I really sincerely hate mm -hmm. it when we just blame the women because that's such an easy cop out. It's such an easy cop out. And I think uh, there's a lot of room. If, if you think about the women that are graduating, even in Malaysia, higher education, right? The IPTAs, 70% of the graduates are women. And if that's not translating into uh, entrepreneurship and, and you know, uh, the, the numbers in, in corporate, what are we doing wrong here? We can't be blaming them. There must be something beyond that, right? It is to do with, even you talk about culture, stereotyping and what's expected of them. I think it's all of those things. And we have a role to play to change that. Yeah. And I think this conversation, like you said, needs to happen because uh, to be very honest, I wasn't very aware of this uh, before I met uh, Adriana Gascoigne, founder of Girls in Tech. And when she pulled me in uh, and I just saw the amount of work that, that needs to happen before people are even aware of the situation, not much less buy into it they, they you know a lot of people don't even know it's an issue to start with so are you still um you know in that advocacy phase do you do a lot of uh, awareness building or right now are you just focused on you know talking to vcs and getting them on board uh so i do it on my for i i guess how do I answer this question? I guess just being who I am, I will advocate for it, right? You know, I will not be silent on an issue that I believe strongly about. So, you know, even in Lean in Malaysia, for example, that's more related to getting women into leadership in Malaysia. We're 7,000 strong now. So when you met us long ago, I think we were half that number. Uh, but, you know, I, I think it, it it's all related, right? So I my tagline to remind myself is, how do I feel women's ambition, power and influence? And that is in everything that I do. And I think that um, advocacy, um, 
is us speaking up about issues we care about. And I think as leaders in corporates, in you know, this is not a job, and I sincerely believe in this, this is not a job just for the chief diversity and inclusion officer. This is something that needs to be owned by everyone in the company because it's about building a culture that is welcoming and is inclusive and productive, right? So, you know, to your question of whether I, I you know, just work from the investment side, I think I work from the investment side, but also in everything I do, you know, it, it touches on all these core things. And even if you think about, we talk about why this issue even exists, right? It is because women currently do not have the power and influence and the capital uh, that they, they should by now to be able to change the landscape. But we're starting to see that, right? Women are investing their own dollars that they've earned. We're seeing a lot of, uh, uh, not just angel investors, um, but but those that are, you know, seniors, CIOs in pension funds and all that, that are saying, um, this is not right. I, I have questions and I want you to be accountable for all these things. Right. Uh, we have a question here uh, from Rahim Osman. And he's asking you if, uh, well, you can see it right there. Uh, investors investing in this part of the world, our part of the world, under this new administration. Good question. So I think you know this is yet to be seen, but you know, there's a, in the first few days of, of uh, Joe Biden's presidency, we've already seen some positive changes, um, including you know the being part, you know, taking an active role in, in advocating for climate. Um, so I, I think in, with that lens in mind, you know, uh, the fact that in Asia, there's a lot of opportunities and untapped opportunities from a sustainability standpoint, I think there is opportunity. We're seeing that. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say yet to be seen. I don't, don't have the crystal ball to say, um, you know, what's going to happen, but I think, um, I'm, I'm feeling optimistic with all the indicators that we've seen, um, and the potential here and, and look you know, beyond, um, beyond just from a government level, the private investors that I work with, you know, we, there's a lot of cross border investment already, uh, to Masse, Singapore, uh, a lot of our, our friends in Singapore are already, you know, well rooted in this, um, in this area and thinking about how do we, uh, do more, you know, sort of cross border as well. So I think it's an opportunity and I'm optimistic. Excellent. Uh, me personally, I'm so thankful that our group chief people officer, Oli Azmi, Norlida Azmi, uh, you know, is a strong advocate for diversity. She is uh, board members and, you know, she's uh, an advocate for the 30% club that, you know, tries to get board representation for, for women. Um, so she does a lot of work for that. And we are having a uh, diversity forum in Selco Maziata that she is speaking at and I'm hosting. So, you know, we, we have to keep plugging at it, I think, at all levels uh, to get that word out and to get people to understand the importance of the issue. So um, I, I just have to try one more time because Ayu has been <laughs> in the back room yes, uh, all this we, hear her. we can hear you now oh, okay finally <laughs> i'm back <laughs> my friend said that they can hear me on clubhouse but they cannot hear me on linkedin <laughs> yeah so welcome thank you how are you sarah <laughs> good i am anxious to hear your question after trying so many times you know so yeah I, you know, true. Page is all yours please say, <laughs> please say please. <laughs> you look like someone that comes from a what you know uh, the crazy rich asian movie <laughs> you look so pretty you know <laughs> thank you so much thank you, thank you. <laughs> all right so uh, one of the questions i was wondering i read some of the articles about you on the um uh, on Google. So the things that I attracted to, uh, um, can you share a little bit? How do you manage to become a vice president at the age of 25? It's so amazing. Vice president at the age of 25, which uh, experience are you um, trying to think? The, yep, because I, uh, I, I read on one of the website, that, that, that he, it stated that you become the vice president at very young age. Yeah. So I'm trying to think now, so this might reveal my age, but <laughs> it's been a while since I thought about my history. I, at 25, I think I was, uh, I was not a vice president. I believe I was a senior executive at that time oh. in Simon Darby, but I was working, uh, I was one of the mm -hmm. first few hires uh, into 
a vet, you know, the copper venture mm -hmm. capital unit that was being started. So, and how I came that, you know, how that came to be, and that's a very important, so, you know, perhaps it, it was picked up as one of my uh, mm -hmm. more important experiences um, because that was really what shifted me into thinking about venture capital. And I have to say it started with uh, the kindness of, of mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of my bosses, one of my favorite bosses, I will always say that, uh, Azli Razali from Sign Darby. Uh, when I was looking to him, frankly, you know, I was, uh, you know, serving my time in corporate and uh, trying to find my way up. And as an ambitious young woman in Malaysia, I, mm -hmm. I think you know how hard that is, right? It yep. can be, it can that feel like, oh, it's such a slog. Um, when am I, you know, I'm, I'm doing my best, but the promotion cycles, and this is through, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can ask Azif here, you know, what he thinks about the promotion cycles and all that, but there are system and legacies in place. And, and I was fully mm -hmm. aware of that, but I was, uh, anxious to do more, right? You know, I, I had a uh, fire in my belly to do more, and I was looking around me, and a lot of, as you know, and in, in especially in the conglomerates, the senior leaders are often uh, from a different generation, and it's hard to see yourself in that. And and I struggled to see role models around me, and I, I asked, you know, around and said, hey, uh, you know, who is a young senior VP or a VP at that time that I can look up to? Mm -hmm. Maybe I can, you know, get some tips from him or her. And Asli's name came about. So he was the vice president. So maybe you could pick that up wrongly. Mm -hmm. But I went to see him in his office. I said, you know, can we have coffee? I just want to get some advice. And as we talked about my experience and he shared a little bit of what he's doing, he actually in that one meeting turned it into an interview, which I just initially wanted to get some tips from him. And he asked me, I can still remember this, Sarah, how many ping pong balls? This is such a consulting question. How many ping pong balls can you fit into a Boeing 747? And as you consultants will know, it's not about the answer, it's how you get to the answer, right? The thinking process. And within that hour that we were chatting in his office, um, in, in the headquarters in Kuala Lumpur, he said, okay, I think, uh, are you game? Like, I, I think you should join my team. You know, we're starting on something exciting here. Uh, and I know you have a law degree. We don't have a, a lawyer in the team. And I think that this could be useful. Um, I'll get the paperwork done. And, you know, Within the next couple of days, I just changed uh, my trajectory. I was in his team, but it all started with me asking the question of not being satisfied with my reality and wanting to change that um, by asking for tips, right? So just genuinely, I want to learn from you. How did you get to be a VP at such a, like, four, he was 40. So, in, wow. you know, it, sure. you know, 40 was young, right, to be yes. a VP. Uh, so... You know, I, I think that was part of the story, and, and I'm so thankful that he gave me the opportunity. The first deal that I worked on with him was a $30 million deal, and that got me hooked on uh, transactions and M&A, and mm -hmm. I loved it. Uh, actually, one of my you know closest friends right now is a, the former CFO of, uh, of my first investment, who is now in the U.S., mm -hmm. and I, you know, we're friends, and he helps me out, and I help him out when we can, so... Uh, that is to say, long story short, is never underestimate your reality and what you can create from that. And uh, yeah, I, I like to think that I'm a testament of that, you know, and uh, just reaching out for more. Okay, uh, I have another question. So um, how do you build the courage? Because like we ourselves, like for my case, right, I'm 20, yep, I'm 24 years old uh, this year. And then I really want to, uh, I want to, I really want to uh, grow on my career. And also I have dreams to uh, uh, to go for, right? And then, but sometimes we, uh, how do you, um, what do you do to stand up from others to be heard? Since we are a woman and also, yeah, like us, we're quite young in, in terms of age, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, I really appreciate that question. And before I answer it, I, I did want to share you know, what mm -hmm. I've been through as well. In Malaysia, actually, when I was younger, actually at 23, after I graduated from King's, my father was unfortunately um, dying from cancer. And I had to, he was running a business, so I had to go and help him and had to pretend uh, that everything was okay while I was taking care of him at home. And this is a very personal story that I'm sure I was taking care of him at home. In the office, I had to show up and try to be a leader, although I you know, basically had no experience leading you know, in, a, in a company where people, I, the, the staff, they were all more experienced and better than me. They were definitely better than me. And in situations where I also felt um, you know, that this was not my place, I actually reached out what was great for me. And I think this could be, uh, helpful for anyone tuning in is 
when you're young, you know, there's a privilege of being young as well in that people are willing to help if you're, uh, if you come from the right place. And for me as a young woman trying to lead, you know, doing my best at that time, I was lucky in that, you know, we were running a franchise business. So there was a CEO in Singapore who was one of my dad's uh, best friends. His name is Leonard. And he would actually mentor me through this process. So even in closing client deals, he would be on the on the phone line tuning into my conversation and giving me feedback. And I would get a script from him. I, I would say, you know, Leonard, oh my goodness, this client is ready to sign the papers. What do I say? And, you know, that's, that's just to show you an example of even though you're young, you can seek experience from those around you and you'll be surprised uh, by how much others are willing to help you. But I have to say, even those in, in those situations where I had to um, look older and especially in Asian culture, I think uh, there's some level of that. So I accept it. You know, I, I, I'll share a funny experience in which I pretended to be married, even though I put a, a <laughs> ring on my finger to look older and put heavy makeup, you know, uh, to look older because I was so afraid of being judged. Like I was dealing with, I remember CIMB, one of the senior vice presidents at the time who basically didn't know who I was, but I was, uh, you know, trying to represent the company. So, uh, you know, that's just to say that I think we all go through it. And I was never, you know, never think that someone like, like me is fearless because even till today, um, there is fear and I don't believe in fearlessness. It's about what do you do with that fear? right it's how do you move forward despite it and i think as a young woman you know sure i i'm, I'm all about celebrating your womanhood but don't see it as uh, never see it as something that limits you never see it as something that limits you see it as a strength and if you're different see it as a strength because diversity is what helps us get to the best solution so i think it, you know what's helpful in, in trying to be courageous is just realizing that um, you have something to bring to the table. Sure, you might not be as experienced or as, um, you know, in the Chinese saying, I'm, I'm Hakka, I'm Hakkian. So that's a Chinese saying that my parents like to say to me, which is, you need to taste more salt. So we're learning from people to taste more salt. And as you taste more salt, um, and, and that's important, you know, I so value learning from others, but realize that you have something unique to bring to the table as well, uh, and that you're willing to learn. That's wow. cool. Yeah, wow. we have a parallel in the Malay proverb of lebih banyak makan garam. So <laughs> the more <laughs> salt that you taste it, yeah, <laughs> the more experience you have. Yep. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, Ayu, for those questions. I think we we brought out a lot of key, um, very important yep. points here. One is to always seek for help, and there's no shame in putting your hand up and saying, you know, I need some help in this. Uh, and I, I know that Ayu herself has several mentors that she always talks about. Uh, and interestingly, one of her most viral posts, and she has several posts that have gone beyond hundreds of thousands of views and thousands wow. and thousands of likes, was about her not being married and having to deal <laughs> with people asking about that. So yeah, I think what yeah. you have yeah. said, Sarah, is definitely resonates uh, with us. And one of my roles as a host is, of course, to time box. Uh, we have been online, you know, time flies when you're having fun. It's been 55 minutes, ladies and gentlemen, and oh, we're wow. still with Sarah Chen <laughs> uh, talking about everything from diversity to breaking down stereotypes to how we can fund more women who are more innovative. And I'd like to uh, share as well, Sarah, as you know, I was leading the Malaysian Innovation Foundation. And, uh, so, and interestingly enough, I think it was split right at the 50% mark because we spoke to at least 2,000 grassroots innovators around the country. And it was 50-50 split. So there was no wow. gender biasness at all. Innovation does not belong to men. I was, I was very clear about that because when we sought out innovations, especially in rural environments, half of them were women who came up with amazing inventions, amazing processes to do things that would help them uh, in their daily lives. So in that sense, it's it's very, very uh, equitable. So Rahim has a follow-up. He says, uh, impressed with the achievements uh, and your guts to climb the ladder. Yeah, I'm sure with success would inspire many women and people in general. What would be the three key pointers you would share with us to climb this ladder? Nice one, Rahim. Oh, thanks, Rahim, for that question. And But as if I did want to comment on what you said there before that, sure. which is very important in regards to the fact that innovation doesn't belong to a single gender, because I think that is so spot on. And the fact that you saw 50-50 split is, I, I'm so happy to say that, that 
that you said that that, that just made my day. And I, I think it's important, you know, we're seeing, especially, you know, I, I'm quite close to the ground in Asia as well. And I know there are a lot of women that are perhaps doing uh, SMEs that are not necessarily within the venture backable space. And people say, oh yeah, you know, it's because women think small. But I like to challenge that in that, you know, if these women are so resilient, and I see this in, in Malaysia, right? You know, you think about all those um, women that are, that are building those fantastic SMEs. If we are to think about the potential that they have, how can we upskill? How can we, you know, like like your work in goals in tech, there's a little bit of exposure that's needed to be uh, given, but the moment they have the skills and the, the confidence to work in those spaces that have typically been uh, alienated from them, I think uh, women will have so much more potential. And I think there there is so much power to be said of uh, how do we get entrepreneurs to be thinking bigger, all entrepreneurs to be in the spaces where they can be also, you know, scaling. Um, and and I, I'm not here to say that venture capital is the answer for everyone. It is not. You know, some businesses just, you know, you can bootstrap a business and get to uh, a great return without giving out your equity for sure. But, um, you know, venture backable businesses, when we talk about that, it's, it's a scalability, right? And I think in Malaysia, there's so much talent, right? Um, you know, the, the reason we started Lean in Malaysia and, and got to this point was when we started, um, we were literally just two women, Abir Abdul Rahim, myself, who were also upset about the fact that we were judged by the ring on our fingers and not what, you know, our career success and all that. And I know IU is not in her head because it's still true today. Um, and we decided, hey, let's, you know, go and invite someone. Uh, we invited Dato Zuraida Atan at the time, who was with Bursa, to speak about her experience. And we said, you know, maybe we'll, we'll have like 10, 15 women come and want to hear your story. We posted on Facebook and we had 80 people show up, both men and women. And that's to show you that the lack of ambition in malaysia is a non-issue there's no lack of ambition there's you know, so many ambitious young men and women who want to do more and i think if we can channel that ambition into sectors that we see for the future right so that's another trend that we need to talk about the future of work are our talent our workforce thinking about what next i think that's going to be uh super important so you know never discount what we see today with the disconnect but it's how do we uh apply you know and, and equip them to uh, do well in the, the future areas of work. And uh, yeah. with that, I'll answer Kim's question. Uh, so the three key pointers I would share is number one is, um, this might be counterintuitive, but be humble, stay humble no matter what, because um, I never think I'm the best person in the room. I always have someone to learn from. Uh, and especially in the corporate setting, this is so important because you wanna come into the, the room sort of being that uh, conduit to bring out the best in everyone, right? And that is certainly a skill uh, to be able to stay humble through it all and also uh, bring out the best in everyone. Because I think once you get to a point of, uh, let's call it middle senior leadership, your job uh, in the words of Jeff Bezos, I'm reading his book right now, it's not about um, your execution capability as much as it is to surround yourself with the right people to execute to their best potential. So I, I think that's number one, you know, in, in staying true to your values. Number two is to always set goals. Um, I'm, I'm such a goal setter and every year I, I renew uh, my goals and, and reflect on my vision. I started doing uh, my vision board for from a decade point of view. And I think that gives you perspective into Okay, um, and, and this is maybe for IU, you, you know, I remember myself in my, when, when I was your age and I felt so anxious that I was not moving fast enough, but time, you know, there's a saying, uh, the, the, the days are long, but the years mm -hmm. are short. So sure. your career is not a sprint, it is a marathon. And if you're consciously building towards your end goal and your end vision, which you should have, and that's my tip, um, sometimes it might take a little bit longer in certain chapters, but sometimes you speed up. So don't worry too much about it. Just make sure you're, you know, persistent and you're going and, and you're following uh, your big goal, right? And, and being open to also, uh, frankly, I, I've had some of my goals uh, being superseded because I, when I was younger, maybe I didn't dream about these things. I didn't know these things. So being open to evolving as well as you evolve, I think that's step number two. And then number three is, um, 
uh, so many tips, uh, but uh, I, I, I always come back to people, 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 because a company is a living organism. It is not, you know, it is not a box. It is about the people you work with. And I've been lucky to have worked with great people who have inspired me, that encouraged me, that kicked me in the bum to, to be better. Um, and that's really um, made me move ahead because I, I wouldn't have been able, even with the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, I mean, we have, I have close to a hundred partners that I work with now and I couldn't have done it without them. And the, the scale effect, the network effect of having others also believe in your vision and then advocate for that because you're one person uh, and you can't do it all. You have to have others who also you know, become leaders, right? And, and in, in a company context, you want them to be your ambassadors. And that's why culture, to bring it back to, to why we're <laughs> here, is so important because it yeah. is the culture it's intangible but it is what we are and, and are to the world wow so just to summarize stay humble set goals surround yourself with the right people uh and with yep. that since you did bring up culture is something that i ask all of my guests since this show is called culturism uh if sarah chen you can define for us what is corporate culture for you Corporate culture is the value systems that we hold and our identity, our shared identity, our shared value system that makes the corporate what it is. So like I said, it, you know, a corporate is the living organism. It's not a box. It is who we are and what we represent. And the culture is what really holds us all together. Wow, that is perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah Chen. Everyone else, please help me to uh, thank Sarah Chen for spending this entire hour with us. Thank you also, Ayu Shahira, for joining us uh, on tonight's okay. show. I do have to say that this was brought to us by uh, Redbit Media as well as Restream.io, who's providing this platform for us to stream. Uh, and if do check them out. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our show, both on LinkedIn and on Clubhouse. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, you can find the reruns on my LinkedIn uh, profile. Just look for Azif on LinkedIn, uh, especially for you guys on uh, Clubhouse. So with that, uh, we'll call it a night here in Malaysia and uh, have a great day ahead, Sarah, in uh, the States and all of you for tuning in from all around the world. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe. And as always, stay kind. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Isaiah. Thanks, Ayu.